I think that coloring comics in the days before computers was fascinating. I have so many questions about it, and today I'm going to ask them and get some answers, especially some of the insights that Tom Luth passed along to me. Yeah, that's right. Tom Luth was kind enough to answer some of my questions about comic color guides. Hi, my name is Darren, these are my hands, and this is GruTube, where we appreciate the art of Aragonese. Except for today. Today, we don't appreciate Sergio's art. Today, we appreciate Tom Luth and the other people who have colored Gru over the past 40 years. And we'll probably appreciate Sergio too. Who am I kidding? So we've been reading Gru the Wanderer comics in color since the very beginning, but how much have you thought about how we get these comics in color? When we think of the artwork in a Gru comic, we give the credit to Sergio, and so we should. He's the master cartoonist. But his pages are so much more wonderful because of the color that Tom Luth so expertly adds to the page. In this video, I have several of Tom's color guides that I want to look at to see how the art that Tom creates makes it onto the printed page. And specifically, I'm going to look at the pre-digital era of Gru the Wanderer comics. I think that means up to epic number 101. I think epic number 102 might be the first digitally colored Gru, but we'll get to that later. But before we look at the guides, I want to talk about how comics were colored back in the days before computers. If you're interested in this subject, check out Marvel Age number 13 and Mark Lehrer's insightful article, How to Color Comics the Marvel Way. Mark explains the printing process that uses only four colors of ink, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, to print full-color comics. Mark writes how mixing various combinations and amounts of ink through the use of screens, which produce those little dot patterns you see in comics, gives colorists 64 colors, plus one more for black, to color the page. It's a really sharp article for those like me who are curious about the old ways of comic creation. The main thing you'll want to understand today is how the three colors, cyan, magenta, and yellow, were combined to make the various colors that could be used in comics. These three primary colors could each be combined with one of the other primary colors to make six colors. Mixing cyan and magenta gives a dark purple. Mixing cyan and yellow gives a bluish green. And mixing yellow and magenta makes a bright red that leans towards pink. And by varying the amount of colors that were mixed together, perhaps only a little bit of yellow with a lot of red, or half-strength blue with full-strength yellow, all these different combinations would get you the 64 different colors. Now, Marvel had their own terms for the four-color process. They called cyan blue and magenta red. This is a comic colorist's color chart. It shows all the various combinations and strengths of colors mixed together, along with the color code that designates those colors. Consider this. Blue at full strength, with nothing mixed into it, was designated B on the color guides. Blue at half strength, a 50% screen of dots, was B3, and a quarter strength blue, with a 25% screen of dots, was labeled B2. The same went for red and yellow. Full strength, or 100% red, was R. 50% red, R3. 25%, R2. Full yellow, Y. Half yellow, Y3. And quarter yellow, Y2. So far, so good. Let's start mixing things. Blue and red, both at full strength, was designated by BR. Makes sense. Yellow and red at full strength together, YR, and yellow and blue together at 100% was designated YB. Mixing various strengths of various colors got you those crazy codes like YRB2. That was Mulch's ready brown fur. Full yellow, full red, 25% blue. Looking for the skin tone of a white person, which is called a good flesh tone in the 1983 article, that's Y2R2. 
That means 25% yellow mixed with 25% red. A brown flesh tone might be YR3B2. That's full yellow, 50% red, and 25% blue. Gru's orange jerkin might be YR3, full yellow and 50% red. A patch of grass could be Y3B3, 50% yellow, 50% blue. Hey Marvel, you made a mistake in 1983. This color here, 50% yellow, 50% red, no blue, that should be Y3R3, not YR3. I wonder how many mistakes were made because of that. <laughs> Probably none. And here are a few examples of color guides that would be produced for comics. When they finish deciding how everything in the comic gets colored, the color guide is sent to what Tom Luth told me was called a color house. He said it was slow and tedious. I asked if he ever did any color separation for his coloring in Gru. He told me he wasn't separating anything for Gru. In addition to painting the color guide, the colorist would indicate the color code designations on the guide so that the color separators would get it right. That's what those scribbles on the color guides mean. The colorist doesn't want the separator to have to guess the color, so they spell out exactly what they want. How color separation is done and then how the separations are used to make the color printing plates is very interesting, but it's also quite involved to explain. And I really want to get looking at some of Tom's color guides. Here we have the color guide for a promotional advertisement for Pacific Comics' Grew the Wanderer that appeared in Captain Victory No. 6 in 1982. This color guide was probably made before Tom Luth was coloring Grew. Remember, he started with issue 4 of PC Grew, so this could be Gordon Kent's work, or maybe somebody else. Grew's jerkin is YR3. His Walkman, B3, 50% cyan. I can't see where any of Gru or the other people's skin color is noted. Now check out the Coming Soon title, where the dark green Y3B and the light green YB2 are used. The separator would be responsible for getting that right and getting it in just the right place. Same with the gradient in the Gru title block, going from full yellow through Y3 and Y2 and then to white. Or the dinosaur's purple skin, R3B3, and its white belly? As a colorist, your careful work is in the hands of the separators. Next, I'm going to pull out Epic Gru number 3 and turn to page 17. Here we have Tom's color guide, and oh, what a lot of color we have going on. Gru's jerkin is still YR3. I guess that was the most orangey-orange you could get with the combination of inks allowed. And how about the light brown of this teddy bear that this young Hetita, or you see a Melanita child, is holding? I might not think that's a good color when I look at the Marvel color guide, but a skilled and experienced colorist like Tom Luth knows that's the right choice and compare it to the darker brown cloak that this Melatita man is wearing. The color guide itself shows the colors very richly in a way that the paper and printing methods of the day couldn't replicate completely. So Tom makes good choices here. And see this piggy's tongue? Tom wanted it to be YR red, full red and full yellow, but the color separator didn't think anyone would notice if they left it out. Well, we noticed. Now we're going to look at a Lil Gru one-page comic in epic number 96. Let's start with Gru's jerkin again. It's still YR3, even when he was Lil. And how about this little girl with the light pink dress? It's very close to her skin color, but it's not precisely the same color. Tom has indicated R2, or 25% red. Now you can't get any less red than that. And if you don't want light pink exactly for a character's skin, well, you throw in the smallest bit of yellow. And notice the sheets on the clothesline here. This dark pink is R4. 
Now we haven't seen that code before, but I presume that if R2 is 25% red and R3 is 50% red, Tom probably means that R4 is full 100% red, or magenta really. So that's why it's a dark pink, whereas this sheet with the yellow accent is YR, full yellow mixed with full red to give the comic a deep, dark red. And on Granny Gru's dress, Tom has indicated two blues, a light blue, B2, and a medium blue, B3, to show some shadow across Granny's back. The separator has rendered this color change not as a gradient, but a crisp line. And we'll see on the cover of this comic how Tom has indicated when he wanted a gradient. So, over to that cover. Take a look at the dark purple sky at the top of the cover. That's RB3. Then, notice how Tom draws a downward arrow and the code R3B2. That's how Tom indicates that he wanted the sky to be a gradient from the dark purple at the top to the lighter purple down at the cloud. And let's appreciate that Tom didn't just drop the blue or drop the red a notch, but by dropping both the red and the blue in value, he doesn't change the color of the sky as much as he changes the saturation of that purple. So the sky doesn't get any redder or bluer. The hue of the purple stays the same, but it becomes more washed out as it approaches the clouds. And the clouds... Tom indicates a gradient from Y2 to Y3 with the arrow pointing right. Such nice work. And look at Gru's jerkin. We've got to check that color code, but where is it? I guess if you're separating the color on the cover of a Gru comic in 1992, you know that Gru's jerkin is YR3. See how Tom paints Gru's jerkin darker on his belly and lighter on his back? Now, Look at the printed cover. The color separator has noticed that too and lightened it up to show the highlight. No one gets credit for that, but whoever you are who cut the color for this comic, we notice and we appreciate it. I could go on about the shadow of Gru in Diothos' hand and the shadows and gradients on the horns of his helmet. We could talk for ages about the minstrel, the sage, and referto in the corner box, but we'd be here all day, so let's look inside. Notice the details of the color in the title. We've got a couple different oranges going on there. And we finally get to see what referto's color code is. Tom notes at the bottom of the page, with an arrow connecting to referto, Y3R2 and y 3 R2, B3. And of course, he's got a white little tummy. So Y3, R2 is Referto's base color, 50% yellow, 25% red. And we can see more of that color on the shirt of the guy running away to the right. It's not as deep of an orange as Gru's jerkin, nor is it as saturated as the color of the shirt of the fellow being carried away on the left of the panel. It's fairly pale, and somewhat muted. Interesting that the second color is used on the top of Referto's back, under his spots. It's also Y3R2, but just the smallest bit of blue with a 25% screen is added to darken his fur. We can take a quick look at Referto on page 5 of the comic to see Tom specifying the same two color codes. I haven't been able to look at many color guides, but I wonder if Y3R2 is a code that Tom reserved mostly for Referto. And we see Mulch with his reddy brown YRB2. Muted dark tones in the background contrast very nicely with the bright colors of the foreground characters. And notice how Tom has colored the sage with two yellows, full strength Y yellow and Y3, a 50% screen. I can see how in his color guide, Tom had to use two very different yellows to show the difference. The full yellow almost looks a little orange or golden to me, but in the actual comic, 
my eyes have a hard time seeing the difference. I do notice it when I look closely, but it's very subtle to me. I wonder if that's just the nature of the yellow ink on an off-white paper. See the title maidens and how Tom has indicated W for white and B2 for a hint of blue? It seems that either the printing process or the color separator was a little heavy-handed, and there's a striking difference between the two colors, not the suggestive gradient that I see Tom calling for. And did you notice the color guide shows a red sash around the waist of the man with the crutch in the bottom left corner? It seems the color separator didn't notice because that sash is missing in the printed comic, just like the missing red piggy tongue we spotted earlier. Tom told me that not only was work in a color house a tedious job, but it wasn't well paid and that some of the people working at it weren't terribly detail oriented. All right, here we have Epic Guru number one. And if you haven't seen Ryan Simmons' color cover proof of it yet, you're in for a real treat. Ryan and I were talking last year around the time he snagged a very unique item from an online auction. He didn't immediately understand what he had, but he knew it was cool. He emailed me some great photos of it and shared some others on the Gru fan groups. Ryan has the original progressive proof for the cover of Epic Gru number one. It's a proof that the printer would make for Marvel so they could okay the art on the cover. That was something that was too expensive to do for the interiors of the comic, so they'd only do it for the cover. And I guess most of the time, once it was approved, it would be thrown away. So it's incredible that Ryan was able to get his hands on this one. You can see how the color would be separated from the color guide into its cyan, yellow, magenta, and black components. If you look really closely, you can see the dot patterns that allow for more or less of the color ink to be printed. Reading from Mark Lehrer's Coloring Comics the Marvel Way again, we learn that even though covers use the same principles as coloring the insides, because the cover is the most critical picture in attracting the reader's attention, the color separation process used for covers allows a full range of colors, including graduated background tones. That's why we see much more blending of color shadows and highlights on Gru's muscular arms, his sausage fingers, and his gourd nose. See how the three color proofs and the black or the key layer all merge together to create a wonderful full color cover. And this is how it works for each page in a Gru comic from this era. Just four colors of ink, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Thank you very much, Ryan, for sharing this wonderful artifact from the color world of Gru with us. I'd like to look at one more piece of art before we finish up this video. Here's the cover for Pacific Comics Gru number one, a seminal piece of work and unique with that menacing shadow that cast across Gru. The background has a gradient, probably from a full yellow at the top to a Y2 at the bottom, but in the middle of it, there's this ominous purple shadow. Take a look at Sergio's artwork for the cover. You'll notice that the title block is a photocopy pasted on the cover so Sergio doesn't have to redraw it each month. You'll also notice blue lines showing where the shadow is to fall on the artwork. Because Sergio didn't want the shadow to be outlined in black, he used a blue pencil which would not appear when copied, nor when the black key plate was made. But Gordon Kent, the original colorist of the first few Grew the Wanderer comics, could use it to create the color guide with the shadows falling exactly where Sergio wanted them. In addition to blue lines making the shadow behind Gru, Sergio indicated where the shadow would fall across Gru, so that Gordon could color Gru with darker skin and a darker jerkin in the appropriate places. Artists and colorists working close together to create an iconic Gru cover. 
I mentioned earlier that I have a suspicion that Epic Gru number 102 might be the first Gru that Tom colored digitally. When I look at some of the colors inside, I don't notice any of the natural transitions that seem to appear between colors when they're done by a person. They look exact, and the colors appear almost flat to me. And where there's shades and gradients, they're so narrow and abrupt, almost as though someone was getting used to the brush tool in Photoshop. But you know what? I was wrong. I asked Tom about it, and he told me that while he made the switch to Photoshop in 1992, which is around the same time that issue 96 came out here, Marvel was the last to get on board with digital coloring. They wanted Tom to paint all of his guides on paper for the entire Epic run. The only exception they made was for the cover of Epic 111, The Man Who Killed Gru. So I'm glad to learn that 102 wasn't an early digital Gru where Tom was learning the tools. I'll just chalk up what I see as unnatural color to a poor color separation job. If you couldn't tell before, I'm sure you know by now. I think that color and the colorists who create the color guides for our favorite comics are incredibly important to creating amazing artwork. It's not my intention to detract from Sergio in any way, but I really want to celebrate and elevate the contributions of Tom Luth and Gordon Kent, Janice Cohen, Deborah Lay, Phil DeWalt, and the others who have sometimes filled in for Tom. But mostly, thank you, Tom Luth, for your dedication to coloring our favorite Wanderer. Your art is extraordinary. If you like this look at Gru the Wanderer color guides, click on the thumbs up button and please subscribe to the channel. I want you to be first to know when I'm back with another GruTube video. Take care, everybody.